Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. Today we have interviews with the actual exhibitors of Milwaukee Maker Fair. With that, here we go. All right, so this is Joe and Chris with Makers on Tap, and who are you guys? So you got Rob and Nick with yep. Makers Mashup. All right, so we are at uh, Milwaukee Maker Fair day two. What's your take on the fair so far? I think it's been great. We've seen a lot of really cool stuff here, and if except for the explosions in the background constantly, I think it's been a really, really fun time. So, so what's your what's your real take on the explosions in the background? Because <laughs> we run a Maker Fest in our town, and this year we were told no loud bangs throughout the day. <laughs> so I I think that but. I'm okay if it's the good rumbling type, the ones that come deep, but the ones that just go like pop, it's like a cap gun. So I really. I really think they got to be good explosions if you're going to have them. So you guys that aren't here, they have a coin exploder at booth about 30 feet away, and that just makes the loudest bang. It is, it, it's like an M80 going off every five or ten minutes, and it just rumbles you to your soul. So what did you guys bring? <laughs> what did we break? Yeah, what, no, what did you guys bring? Oh, what, what did we bring? Have? Oh, uh, so we. Uh, this is a custom 3D printer that we've uh, been designing ourselves. Uh, we call it the Layer Fuse X302. It is a core XY printer, but some of the really cool features about it is that uh, if you look at the front of it, unlike a lot of printers like the Hypercube, there are no front uh, supports in the in the front of it. So when you go to get your print off, you're not working around yes. a frame that's in your way. So it's a very open printer. The other thing that we're doing with this printer and the other one that we brought here is that as part of our YouTube series, we're showing people how to build these printers start to finish. Okay. So how to get a high quality printer just by watching the YouTube video, buy the parts online, you can get them from AliExpress or Amazon, wherever you choose and save a lot of money and get a really, really high quality printer. This one is a dual nozzle and a 300 by 300 by 300 build area. Okay, so these are open source then? Uh, it will be open source. All the plans aren't online yet because we are still developing this one, but this one over here is all open source and it is available online. Okay, awesome. Um, and then you had a runout sensor or something? That you guys were yeah, with? so the filament runout sensors, uh, another one of our creations, open source project, you can download online. What's really cool about that is it's designed, it's it's designed so that way it can be mobile between printers. Now, okay. if you have one printer and then you say to yourself, "Oh no, I'm not going to have enough filament," you can actually attach the runout sensor to it, and it works over Octoprint, so that way it will tell Octoprint to pause your printer. So even if you have a printer that doesn't support a pin for yeah, yeah. Uh, the runout sensor, this will work through Octoprint. So the only real requirements to have Octoprint running on your 3D printer, but then you'd be able to use this wireless sensor, and it doesn't even have to be next to Octoprint. It just goes over your Wi-Fi and your network. Nice. So you can throw the printer or the sensor on mid-print if you Yeah, can. so... Right now, uh, this model doesn't have it, but there's another model that has grooves, so that way you can just open the case, slide it in, twist the screws, and there you oh, go. that's awesome. Yeah. That's really awesome. Yep. It, so what's that project called? Uh, it's the uh, Run Out of Anywhere project, okay. and uh, it's on Thingiverse and available on the website, and uh, there's a whole YouTube video that shows you how we work it, so you can watch that as well. Awesome. Well, thanks for talking to us. Uh, Chris, did you have any questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for talking to us. Again, this is Makers on Tap at Milwaukee Maker Fair with, who are you guys again? Makersmashup.com. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Hey. All right, so we are back at the Milwaukee Maker Fair, and I am joined with... Isaac Ballone. I'm a student at the Milwaukee School of Engineering, and I am a part of the MSUE Game Development Club. And what does the MSUE Game Development Club do? So we... Um, we have people from all different ages, like for freshman through sophomore, senior, and we just make games. Awesome. Yeah. What are so, so you have a couple games here. I'm seeing Melvin the Duck, exactly. which is an awesome title already. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about these games? Yeah, so, so this one here is made in JavaScript using a 2D framework called PhaserJS. And uh, the graphics are hand-drawn by my girlfriend, and we scanned them in using a, 
a printer and then I just animated them. So they're all static images, but then I do little animation tweens on them to give them like nice little effects. Nah, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, what is, so you've got another one over here as well. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so this one's called Euclid's Dreamland. And if you've ever played Portal 2, um, you'll definitely get some of those vibes from it. So it's uh, kind of okay. like interdimensional stuff. So you can, on, on one version of reality, this hallway is blocked. But then if you look through the portal, you'll see that in another dimension, the hallway is not blocked. And then you'd be able to walk through it. So it's a sort of a puzzle game kind of story. So what, it, like, how long have you guys been around doing this kind of awesome stuff? So the MSOE Game Development Club has been around for two years now. And we're getting better each year. It's kind of an iterative process. And we're getting a lot of people um, joined in this year. And we're, we're uh, hosting a game jam uh, Saturday, yes. the 21st. Okay. And we're going to be um, getting a lot of the new members of the club to... Um, to kind of get started because a, a big problem was there's a lot of people who join the club and then they have um, issues because they don't know how to program but or, or like or game develop and it's actually really easy and we're, we're trying to you know get kind of get them into it and get the ball rolling that's awesome so are you guys hosting these games anywhere can people come or like find these on the internet yet or on steam or yeah, so you can find my game on onlinecoop.games. Okay. And there's even a multiplayer version of it. Yes. So you you can be joined by Melvin's girlfriend Daphne, <laughs> and you can bonk junk together. Um, where other people's games are, are held, I'd have to double check because I don't think we have a full. Uh... Oh, actually, you can go to the. MSOE-SSE.com okay. and you might, you'll be able to find some of the games there. Awesome. Oh, yeah. And do you guys have any social media that you're, you tweet out or Instagram out some of your like uh, projects or anything like that? I would go back to that MSOE-SSE.com website. That's awesome. Okay. Well, we want to push more people to you. Thank you for having us and telling us about your projects. All right. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Awesome. All right. Welcome back. Um, we are still at Milwaukee Maker Fair having an amazing time, and I am joined by... Hey, everybody. I'm Shane Guprode. Awesome. And Shane, what have you got here? You've got some amazing things that we've already gotten to play a little bit, but tell us a little bit about your area. For sure. So we have a wide range of things at the booth here. So this is really our Kettle Moraine School District booth. So this is where I'm showing off uh, stuff that my students have made because all my students are designers and makers. They all get the chance, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, to design and make different things. So we have things that range from ski golf to the world's most uncomfortable chair. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also have uh, my passion of arcade games. So now some of my students have made their own arcade games. And of course, um, we also brought, brought teachers can be makers too. So I brought what I made. So my friend and I made our game called Cosmotrons, which is a four-player space battle arcade game. So did you guys actually not only make the, I'm guessing you made the cabinet, but you guys made the game as well? Everything. Wow. So, so okay. every single thing. So this is a, now, it's about a three-year project at this point where we're at. And it started as a passion project. I had an idea for a type of video game I wanted to play. I wanted a four-player space battle arcade, arcade game that used gravity. But I also wanted a super cool cabinet because I collect arcade machines. Yeah. So then uh, using kind of you know what I learned from class and 3D modeling and designing, designed the cabinet. Um, and then my friend Dave, he's a programmer by trade. He did the programming work. And then I did the game design. I actually teach a game design class. So it's kind of all these, all our skills kind of combine to create this adventure. No, it's it, like we got, me and Joe actually already played it for a little bit. It was a lot of fun. Um, it like, is it available anywhere else to be able to download? So it's not for home yet. Okay. At some point we want to do a home release. Yeah. But as of right now, Cosmotrons can only be played in the arcade. And we have them at about, it's like a, around 40 locations throughout the whole country at this point. No, that's awesome. That's Wow, that's really cool. So you you say you teach at uh, a school in, in from um, it sounds like middle school. Yes. Um, what like what got you into making and teaching and all that? I've always kind of even since young, I've always been interested in designing and making things to a certain extent. Like whether it be just with like Legos, 
or um, I'm just a wide range of things. I always, I'm, in, I'm a car guy too, so that kind of mechanical side. Yeah. Um, I always love making kind of things with wood. And then eventually just, once I actually started teaching a design class, which I had to go to training for to learn how to use like Autodesk Inventor, do 3D modeling. Yep. And just once I started breaking it down more for the kids and then including game design, that just made me look at things differently and more interested in it to the point that I then wanted to create my own things even more yeah. and more in depth, which then resulted in our passion project, which then resulted in now a business. That's amazing. Well, we don't want to keep you too long. Thank you so much for encouraging the next generation of makers and bringing up just such awesome. It's, it's always great to hear when teachers are so passionate about what they're actually doing. So thank you for your contribution to the community and for building such amazing things. You bet, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So this is Joe, Makers on Tap. And today we have... Hi, I'm Ray Kolodowski. I uh, run Cohesion 3D, where we make really cool things for lasers. Like what? So we make uh, controllers, uh, so that you can make your uh, Chinese laser cutters, like the K40 Not Suck. You <laughs> can use the uh, Better Light Burn software. And we have a bunch of other parts. And most recently, we released a uh, very high quality uh, rotary attachment, so that you can do round cool things on round. your laser. So what's the, what are your boards based off of? Um, so the Smoothieware firmware and uh their brain design if you will and then we just kind of built out all of the uh peripherals and the layout and just all the connections uh from the brain and we made our layout and our connections specific to the application which right now is uh laser cutters what um I mean, what made you do laser cutters that's a bit of a loaded question. It is a, yeah, yeah. So, like, I come from uh, 3D printing, and there was, like, about five tangents of movement that got me to where I am today. Uh, this started back in, like, uh, October 2013. I was doing CAD design work for a client, and he was like, we need to realize a physical prototype of this. So we went to New York Maker Faire. I'm from New Jersey, so that was close. And we looked at a whole bunch of th different 3D printers, I uh, saw a bunch of stuff, including the uh, G Max by G Create. That's going to be important a little later. And I saw that and I was like, this is cool. They had just had their Kickstarter like that summer. Okay. And they were showing the machine off like they weren't shipping yet, I don't think. Uh, designs weren't out there. Uh, it was just, they were there. I saw this. It's big. It's cool. We'll get back to it in a moment. Um, but in December, he ended up getting a uh, Printer Bot Plus. This was like the last of the laser cut wooden ones. Okay. The following year was when they started doing the Sheet Metal Plus, which is also awesome. Uh, so we got that, and I got really into 3D printing. And then I eventually used that printer to make the parts for my own first printer, which ended up being the G-Max. Uh, so they eventually released their STL files and their instruction manual, and that was it. And I looked at it and was like, I can do this myself. <laughs> and so I reverse engineered a bill of materials from their instruction manual, and I printed their STL files. And I... Uh, I built that machine myself. And then I got involved with a lot of their other users, their actual customers. And uh, I started improving. And I was like, I can do better. Nice. And I started designing my own 3D printers. And that takes me through possibly up to two years of learning a lot and designing my own printers, which would have been like uh, sheet metal design machines with uh, very, very specific design constraints, like moving the bed on an i3 style machine is a contradictory thing, which I know now is a complicated thing, a complicated statement to make. But back then I was like, look, you want this bed to be rigid, but you also need to fling it back and forth relatively fast. And that means I can't make it heavy. So that contradicts itself. So let's go with CNC frames. And let's make it so the bed is completely static and we'll move the head in all three axes around it. And so the Y rails sort of, it's kind of like the open built ox in a sense where you have the dual Y motors Yeah. and then put the Z on that and then put the X on that. So the head moved in all three axes around. And that was a sheet metal body. Okay. So I was working on that and I was getting ready to sell that. And this is around the time that Creality printers start coming out. And I'm like, so sheet metal in America is really expensive. And so I'd have to sell this machine for in like the $2,000 range. It was a really good printer for what it was, but $400. And so I was like, this isn't viable. And then there was a few months where I just wasn't doing things anymore. And uh, 
Then this uh, derivative of the smoothie board comes out on Google Plus, uh, the good old days of Google Plus. I miss Google Plus. I do too. The land of smart social media. That, that were there because they wanted to be there, not because the UI was pleasant. Yes. <laughs> yes, that. So uh, there's this design floating around for the, uh, the smoothie brain. There was no drivers on it. It was meant for larger machines that were running external drivers. The smoothie brains. Yes, that. Uh, and there were some people that were clamoring for this, like, I want this board. And I'm like, well, I need money. I was one of them. Yes, you were. <laughs> and uh, I was like, I'll build a few of these by hand. And so I did. And then I was like, but wait, this is 100 millimeters by 80 millimeters. If I can make the PCB 100 by 100 millimeters, it's going to cost the same to make, but I can put a row of drivers on the top and then that got me started into what that became my first board which was the remix which was like this monster six axis driver for your multicolor 3d printer slash other extreme machine somebody may or may not have done a six axis robotic arm with it may or may not have and also a uh, uh this guy eric ended up doing a wax jetting printer in uh that's cool eric cedarberg i forget which european country he's in uh sweden sweden possibly uh but yeah no that had a twenty thousand dollar wax jetting head on it oh my god and my board drove that so that was kind of cool tangential to what we were shooting for which was 3d printers cncs and lasers yeah but i released that and then i made a mini which was four axis so like you know there was a lot of stuff in the market for mid-range with like five drivers and like that's covered let's go extreme with six drivers and everything extreme and then four axis and we can do that cheaper and that's like for your basic um 3d printer with just like an i3 or a delta with one head and a heated bed so we had that and along the way uh the k40 was a popular laser and people were putting smoothie boards in that but it required a lot of rewiring yes and like i ended up getting one along the way just to like it was just like another box that I wanted to tick for compatibility. I was like, yeah, there's some unique connectors. We can make a variation of the mini board where uh, we can, you know, like we can address that installation. And it's like, hey, it works with this laser. Why not? People are doing this. Sure. You don't need fully decked out multiple hundreds of dollars and rewiring into that. We can do this little board for $100 and it'll do the things. Yeah. Uh, and that... You were one of the first people to get that. You got the... There were five versions before we hit production. You got, like, one of the first three where it was uh, very different than what the rest of the world got to see. Yes. And you remember it. And yep. you gave me feedback. And I can't admit a lot of the things <laughs> that were on that board. It worked, though. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, but, it, like... It ran the K40 in our makerspace up until last year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it worked, but like you gave me good feedback on you can't have this huge power plug on this tiny little header as a separate board. So you were the guy that was like, and let's make the board a little bigger and we'll put all the connectors directly on it instead of like these little shield piggyback modules or what I call the full castle configuration because you just had stuff sticking out everywhere. Yes. <laughs> That's the one you had. And you were potentially the only person aside from me that ever had that. I mean, I had one of those in my K40 and I was happy, but you were the only other person that had one. But you gave me good feedback. We made that. So, it was the, so that became the Cohesion 3D Mini uh, that the public got to see. And so it would drive a 3D printer, it would drive a CNC, and oh, we also have a bundle that you can upgrade the K40 as just, here's another thing that I want to do because the community is doing this and we want to support it. Yeah. And then we launched, and that ended up being like something like 90% of my sales is the laser upgrade bundle. And like, I guess what ended up happening was, uh, you know, like there was a lot of stuff already out there for 3D printing and whatnot. Like we still sold boards by themselves for 3D printers. Yeah. We tried to get into that. But like 90% of the sales ended up being for laser cutters. So you found your niche. Yeah. Which exactly. was not the niche you expected, but it was the I niche I wasn't you opposed needed. to it. Yeah. It was like, you know, throw a bunch of noodles on the wall, see what sticks. I wasn't expecting it, but... This is how it works. Uh, that's where a lot of maker-based businesses end up. Like you, you start making something that you think is really cool, and then other people are like, "Well, you know, if you did this, this is pretty great." And you're like, "Oh, there's there's my niche." Yeah. But like the thing is, I wasn't all that familiar with lasers, right? Like, so the way the timeline works is, I had been doing the 3D printer stuff since October of like 2013 or 2014, right? Because that's when New York Maker Fair was. October 2013 and then later that year is when I started doing printers. And April 2016 is when I bought a K40 and put the very first prototype that we discussed of the C3D Mini into it on day one. So like day zero is I took it out of the box and I test fired it. And I didn't even load the stock software. Don't get me started on that. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> and uh, I test fired it and like I turned it on and it homed and that was it. I never even hooked up to a computer. And then the next day is like I took the stock board out and I put the first prototype of the Mini in. 
and that started a thing but like okay great and like it works and i cut some stuff with it and i rastered some stuff with it and okay it works great uh Okay, apparently I now represent a whole bunch of laser cutting stuff. I need to learn. And so I slowly started learning. But like I had three years plus of 3D printing under my belt. I had like three weeks of lasering. And now, another three years later, I'm like really into lasers now. Yeah. But like that was the surprising part. It was like I had so many 3D printers and I had one little laser that I sort of kind of used a few times. I'm a big fan of lasers. I know. We, we talk a lot about 3D printing on the show, but one of my bigger passions is laser cutters because there's there are a few things in the maker world that you can start the day out knowing absolutely nothing you can spend five minutes learning inkscape or you can download an, an image from the internet and 20 minutes later you have your first thing that you've made it's it's the quickest zero to made uh maker machine that i've ever experienced i know the, the only thing that's comparable is maybe a vinyl cutter I know exactly which machine you're thinking about as you say all this. Um, so I would say that the caveat is if you get a machine that's actually like aligned and functional out of the box. If you get a machine oh, that's Oh, no, broken, I'm talking about like if you're at a makerspace that oh, has okay. a functional machine and you walk in on, on day zero and you're like, I want to learn the laser cutter. An hour from that moment, you will have your first laser cut object. That is completely correct. If you buy a laser cutter, it's a different world. <laughs> right, so that's what I thought you were talking about. And I was going to introduce the caveat of... If you don't have to spend three months, or not three months, but like if, if you don't have to like align it, like if it came reasonably aligned out of the box and whatnot, you can get like a K40 for 300 bucks. You can put our cohesion port in it. And for a very small investment, you can be operational. Yeah. And it actually works. That's cool too. It's like, it's, there's give and take with 3D printing. It's like, you don't have to level a bed necessarily, but if you have to align your optics and you're new to this, you're in for a world, world of hurt. So like I would say that that's the distinguishing factor between operational out of the box and Oh dear God! Yeah, and like that's that's the high point for diode lasers. Like we've had M Blazer or yeah. Darkly Labs on the show, yeah. and like the the M Blazer was a an eye opener for me because it, it was the first laser cutter I'd ever experienced. Where like I opened the box, I set it on the desk, and the machine just worked. And I was like, Oh, I remember this you is me weird. This. Um, but you What's know happened? my. K40, my the last K40 that I did, it was almost like that. I didn't have to. It came aligned, which yep. was weird. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. And um, I had the C3D Mini, and that was like a 15-minute drop-in. Could have probably been faster, but, you know, I checked Turning the things. Bolts. And then the laser worked. Yeah, that one I didn't even test fire. I just... I gutted it the second I had it. Um, so, so that kind of brings me to the the one point that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is, um, you know, in the maker world, a lot of times I think we take the hard way around to save ten dollars, or you know, like oh, I don't want to do this because uh, to be more real, I want to. I want to like rewire the laser and do it the hard way. So people will go and buy like the MKS boards mm -hmm. or a smoothie board mm -hmm. instead of the cohesion board. And, um, you know, what, what's the, what's the argument for the laser board over any of those others? I Why? see this on the, uh, the Facebook laser groups all the time where people are like, well, no, I'll just straight up tell you where people comment. Um, you know, the, the laser board is so overpriced. This is a highway robbery. And I'm like, I don't publicly respond to this, but I think to myself, well, how much is your time worth? Yes. How much aggravation can you sustain? I can take a lot of punishment, but I know what I'm doing and I've been doing this for a while. You're new to lasering. Do you want to fiddle with the machine for the next three months or do you want to make stuff from day one for the next three months? That's really what it comes down to. So if you get uh, pretty much any other board that isn't a drop-in replacement, uh, you have to know how to rewire. You have to configure the thing because it's, there's settings where you have to tell it, like, you know, well, the homing switches are in this corner and here's all these other laser parameters and this is the size of the bed and we're homing here and we're doing that. Um, and, like, you have to spend the time learning how to do that. Yes, you can do it. It helps if you're more tech savvy and like you've done 3D printer wiring before, as a number of people do. So like those are the people who are like, you know, well, I've I've rewired a 3D printer before. I know how to do this with an MKS. Okay, uh, you're totally free to go do that. Uh, meanwhile, here's what the cohesion offers you: 
uh, the K40 has a board in it called the M2 Nano, usually, uh, with four to three to five wires, four wires, four cables, with really weird connectors on them. Yes. Okay. So the cohesion board has all the same connectors. So you take out the old board and you put in the new board and you plug the four wires into it and you put the memory card into it and it, it works. And then you don't have to know anything about anything because I took care of all that for you. Yes. And so the thing is, you don't have to do a configuration because we already configured it for the K40. And if you have a larger machine, it's just a few things in a text file that you change to tell it, oh, I have this larger size bed yep. and my motors need more power and we'll tell you all this. And that's that. Uh, and then the other part is like the K40. Um, I hesitate to just straight up say it'll set your house on fire because it's it's reasonable. You should always watch your laser when you're using it. So if there's a flame <laughs> yes. up, don't get me started on this. Uh, that's a separate matter. Yeah. Uh, always watch your laser when it's working because it produces fire as its primary mode of function. And I prefer if your house remains standing without char. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, yeah, so it's like there's there's stuff to do. So like what I what I get told is you said it was tw- a twenty minute install. I did it in ten, and nine of those was fiddling with the bolts to get the old board out. Yes, I'm like liar. It's not supposed to be that quick. Uh, it I is. don't believe you. It is. I've done it. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> but yeah, that's really it. It's it's turnkey and it has support. And so the other thing I was gonna get at. So not the fire comment, but the comment about so like the the K40 and a lot of these Chinese lasers. The components they use are very shoddy. So there's a laser power supply in there, and this is the box that makes the 10 to 15,000 volts that fires the tube so that you can have your fire in the form of light from the heavens (laughs) uh, cutting your things for you. But it also, uh, like your stepper motors and your board run on 24 volts. So it does a reasonably good job at the 15,000 volts. It does a very, very bad job at the 24 volts. Yes. And so with our previous board, the Mini, we just sent you a board, and like the stock board runs off of that 24-volt rail, but like it's just barely hanging on. And with the new board, you're getting all this extra power, so it needs more amperage. And you don't get that with the stock board. So like we were telling people for the better part of a year, like you're having this stability issue because the stock laser power supply can't provide enough current. So you should really install a separate 24-volt power supply and you're going to see a huge current uh, improvement in performance. Yes. And uh, people wiring things sometimes doesn't go well. So on the new laser board, we did all of it for you. So the 24 volts from the power plug coming from the laser power supply is now pre-disconnected for you on the board. And we sell you, as part of the bundle, a 24-volt, 4-amp power brick. That's very high-quality, UL-certified, all the good things, because we care about these things. Yes. As opposed to CE, meaning the other thing, not the thing you China equipment. China (laughs) export, whatever it is. (laughs) Yeah. There's a way to figure out which CE mark you have, but I won't go into that right now. So, yeah, uh, just we take care of all the problems for you. The new board is highly isolated. It has all of these other expansions, and you just plug it in, and it works, and then you can go use Lightburn, which is the best software in the laser market right now. And you don't have to worry about all that other crap that I just told you about because I did it for you. I did the worrying for you and the learning for you once. So you just pay the money and you put it in and I I treat it as a total cost sort of deal. It's roughly a $350 on eBay uh, K40 machine plus a couple of hundred dollars in controllers, electronics, and one or two other upgrades. I tell people that they should expect a total investment of approximately $700. And the next machine up is in the thousands of dollars. Yes. And it may or may not have all the same exact problems and pitfalls that I just told you about. Yeah. So you can get a thing that works really, really well if you can put in a little bit of work. It's really not that much. It, the 24 volt power supply thing is, is funny because the um, the K40 that I had when we were testing the original Mini, we were running the 24 volt side off of the 24 volt power rail on the laser power supply, and um, I actually had, I think I may have been talking to you the night it happened. I had the caps on the 24 volt side explode mid job on the c3d board or in the laser power supply in the laser power supply oh yeah that happens if you overload it they are big caps it i thought the laser tube and like my whole world was letting go because i was standing right next to the machine and it was like a shotgun it's like oh my god it, it, it you know the laser power supply never stopped and that's a big reason why you should um never walk away from your machine because all of a sudden I'm making fire in one spot at full power right. instead of making fire as I am traveling along at a high speed. So I'm just boring into a flammable material with a fire spot in one spot. So then you know my project immediately ignited because the laser had stalled. 
and uh that was a that was a really bad thing so you know that's why you guys did all of the things with the laser board right yep uh, the separate power supply uh, with the 24 volts, it helps stability improvement. It lets you do other things. So another thing that you can do is the stock board will just drive X, Y. Uh, so your head moves in left and right, X, and back and forth, Y, forward and back. Uh, but you can also hook up a Z table to move up and down to focus materials of different lengths, I'm sorry, different thicknesses. Or if you have a really thick material, you can do multiple passes where it goes a little bit and then it moves up and it goes a little bit more and so on. And a rotary yes. so that you can engrave round things. Uh, our board runs all that natively, so you don't have to change out wires and or do other electronics. So you need a lot of power to do all this. Yep. And you can run really fast, too. And so, separate power supply. It, my favorite part about running G-code-based lasers with things like rotaries or... Um, you know, large travel Z-tables is doing weird stuff, like cutting on a rotary is totally possible whereas with a dsp controller cutting on a rotary is kind of hard to do or doing weird things like the laser origami project where they're defocusing the laser to let acrylic bend Mm -hmm. instead of cut Mm -hmm. is almost impossible to do with the dsp based software we had that inquiry on the lightburn forum a little while ago i was like i have a dsp i want to do this and it's like "Yeah, yeah well Good luck with that. It'll have to be multiple jobs, you want, and you'll have to figure out how to queue everything up. And he needed like the Z to move in very specific things, so that you could do the hatch for the melt and then drop. Yes. So that it could uh, bend by gravity, if I recall yep. this correctly. Yeah. Good luck with that. G code is no problem. Yeah. So. G code. Speaking of G code, so we have better firmware, right? Yes. Yeah. So you guys, you guys covered this announcement back when we did it. We did. Yeah. yeah. That was cool. So like, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that I got some technical things wrong. So go ahead and uh, fix right. that. <laughs> well, yeah. So um, the way this works. So uh, our boards run Smoothieware, open source firmware. We like it. It's um, the motion planning is good and bad. Yeah. Uh, it's good because it's higher order. So it's more continuous than, for example, Gerbil, which just uses trapezoidal acceleration. With Smoothie, I hesitate to say exactly what it is. It might be S-curve, but like it's higher order. So you get like these, um, when you're cutting, you get like these nicer um, corners, rounds, whatever. Um, however, Smoothie, the way it was written, um, hesitates or struggles when you send it a lot of commands very quickly. And when you're raster engraving images with G-code, that's exactly what happens. You're literally sending something like G1, which means move, and then X0.1, because if you're cutting at uh, 254 DPI, that's, uh, you know, 0.1 millimeters. Every dot is 0.1 millimeters in diameter. So X0.1, and then S for the power level, so something like 0.6 would be 60% power, and then F for speed, so like F600. So that string for every single dot. So it's, it's extremely verbose. Yes. And uh, Smoothieware stock, with minimal optimizations before we did the firmware work, could take approximately 800 to 1,000 of those commands before it started to choke. So what that means for you is uh, if you're engraving with the parameters that I've just specified, you could only go, uh, in theory, at 100 millimeters a second and in real life more like 80 before you started to get like these weird shifting artifacts where like you had yes. you know, like a stripe here and then the next stripe was like offset by 10 millimeters and just weird stuff like that. And people thought their mechanics were slipping. So it was really weird. And I'm like, no, it's actually this other thing and we're at the mercy of the firmware that we used but open source yay so after a while of this uh we worked with uh, the lightburn developer and we implemented this thing called clustering so what clustering is is instead of so like we still abide by g-code sort of kind of so it's still a g1 move but instead of a g1 move per dot we're now sticking five power levels aka five dots into that single move because you're moving at the same speed at the same yeah at the same speed in the same direction the only thing is you have five dots at five different power levels so we just give it five different power levels that are colon separated. And okay. it can be more. I think uh, the firmware supports up to eight, I believe. But in Lightburn, because actually the firmware, and this is interesting, the firmware is the easy part. I couldn't do it. The Lightburn developer, Oz, did it. But then there was like 10 times as much work into Lightburn generating that G-code and counting for all the different edge cases of like, yeah, it's this and that case and everything. But the result is you can now go three times faster. Easily. Yes. So when you used to be able to do 80 millimeters a second, uh, by the way, grayscale, because grayscale is when you actually have, you know, the different power levels. Yeah. 
um, you can now do 240, I believe, is what we're uh, saying. 210 to 240 uh, without skipping. And now it shouldn't actually do the slide artifact either. Uh, it should just, if you tell it to go to 700 millimeters a second, hypothetically, it just, it'll do whatever it can handle, but like it's not going to slide or crash on you necessarily. Right. Why? Because one of our beta testers is like, I'm, uh, I'm rastering at 700 millimeters a second. And like, I'm so happy to hear that you think you are. You're yeah. not, but you're not getting any problems. It's just not going as fa faster than it can handle. That's great. And for a K40 style and size machine, that's plenty enough because oh God, yeah. a little a little bit faster and the machine's literally going to shake itself apart. Yeah. So we're plenty good there. Yeah. So like that's another thing is like we do all this work for you so that you don't have to worry about any of this stuff or deal with that. Yes. That was like two years of my life stressing about this. And then, you know, it just now you have it and that's it and it works. So we've talked a lot about the boards. What else are we doing or are you doing with the uh, cohesion? I mean, so we've become laser focused. So I mentioned my roots and the roots of the company. We made controllers for general purpose, 3D printers, CNC, laser cutter, and then the laser stuff stuck. So with the new board, we became laser focused. Ha ha, pun intended. <laughs> very, very bad pun, but that's just the one that comes to mind immediately. Marketing Always. puns. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe that should be a tweet because Twitter. But anyways, uh, we did that. So we came laser, laser focused with the board. We have other laser parts. Uh, I hesitate to sell very large, fragile items like tubes, but smaller parts, optics, we've had those for a while. Uh, we have the rotary now. Uh, the rotary, is, compared to the competition, there's uh, the structural parts are all CNC machined. Wheels need to be round. When you 3D print wheels, like some of our competitors do, there is a seam. Yep. So by definition, it will not spin true. It is not concentric. Yeah. We CNC machine that. It's very precise. I jokingly say when I tell people we made a rotary, no, we've made a surgical grade hot dog roller for the aerospace industry that can also work in your laser for a very reasonable price. Yes. So all those uh, main drive components are CNC machined. We 3D print a few things like the end caps for the extrusions, uh, but you know that's, that's non-critical. Uh, but we have that. Uh, we have aluminum extrusions that if you select the black ones, we're actually laser engraving tick marks into them. So it's almost like having a tape measure right on it without actual numbers. It's just yep. tick marks with uh, patterns that you can know where you are. And that way you can align your uh, idler assembly. So like there's the system that slides back so you can count for how much diameter, how, how large your ob object is in diameter, how long it is, yes. and whether you need something very, very compact and low like a pencil or very, very tall and wide. Like if you imagine the side view of a wine bottle, you put the wine containing end on the drive wheels and then you need to account for a very very smaller diameter and very very high neck yep so we give you that range and it's all toolless too so you don't need any hex wrenches or anything to assemble it you just turn the thumb screws and the thumb nuts yeah and it comes like 99 percent assembled it was just a shipping box thing so i have to take the uh, little idler assembly off and bubble wrap that and put that separately in the box and then you get it and you put it on and you put these two thumb screws on and you're operational. Yeah. And then we cover all the different lasers. So if you have a uh, K40 with our new laser board, you just plug the motor into the A for rotary port, and you adjust a few settings, and that's it, and you go use it. And if you have a uh, larger machine with a DSP controller, uh, those have external drivers, and it gets a little different. But we have uh, various wiring solutions, and we will work with you to get you up and running yeah. on those. So you will work with people to get you up and running. Like, oh, absolutely. How, how, how are all the things supported? Uh, we have a uh, support forum. And I'm, I'm very particular about certain things like making information available to all. So like people will email us with tech support questions and you know like on our contact form it's like if you have a tech support question please post it in the forum. Yeah. And perhaps I could elaborate a little more on this so people don't think we're blowing them off. We're not. It's like it's the difference between typing your things into one box in your internet browser versus a different box in your internet browser. That's it. So when you post to the forum, we answer you. We answer you quickly because frankly I can't stomach answering emails because it just feels like more formal and I have to account for more things because of response times and whatnot. But with the forum I can ping pong back and forth real quick and just go back and forth with you much quicker and somewhat more informally and just yeah. get to the root of the issue and help you out and it's just so much nicer for editing and like i can document things right in there so i just write all my documentation right in the forum because markdown is awesome and the discourse forum 
editor is just great for that. Yeah. But the main thing is all that stuff is there for the next person that has the same question. I don't have to rewrite it in an email chain that nobody's ever seeing. It's just there. And I can be like, look here. Yeah. And if you dare, you can even search for it and find it yourself. But like, I totally Nobody love talking that. to people. <laughs> it's just like doing it in a way that I can keep doing what I'm doing. That's sustainable. Right? Yes. That's sustainable, right? Like email or phone support. Or phone support would absolutely not be sustainable. We would have to triple our prices, hire support staff. And I don't want to do that. I think we're at a really good price point right now where it's, uh, it's great value. And it lets me keep doing what I'm doing. And the way we do that is we will talk to you on email, but we will ask that you post to the forum. And uh, that is so that it will benefit other people. Yeah. And it's all there. And yeah, I just I love it. I love that. Awesome. Well, I think we kind of covered everything. Is there anything that you specifically want to say? Where do people find all of your things? Where, where, where they buy things? Where they find you on the social medias? So our username would be Cohesion3D in most of the places. I've been using Twitter more lately, so that's cool. Our website is Cohesion3D.com. So C-O-H-E-S-I-O-N, the number three, the letter D, dot com. Uh, you can find us there. You can talk to us on the forum, which is linked on the page. That's like, seriously, I love talking to people on the forum yeah. and it's great. And I'm like, yes, you're doing the things. It's awesome. Uh, and then we also go to a lot of the shows like Murph and Irv, and we were doing other maker fairs like New York and Bay area before they shut down. So a number of, uh, our friends like Joe was like, you should come to Milwaukee. I'm yep. like, okay, sure. Yeah. So we're, we're at the Milwaukee maker fair right now. And it's just been a really awesome show and it, it's neat to see how it's grown and how the community has adapted to the loss of those maker fairs and come to a really centralized area like milwaukee so. i mean it was pretty straightforward there was one thread on twitter where everybody said ray you should come here yeah and i did yeah <laughs> and that was that so all right well with that this has been joe and ray for makers on tap this is the end of the podcast